I see folks are coming in. Thanks for being here and joining us today. I'm gonna to give it a few minutes as I see lots of people entering and then we'll get started. All right, I'm going to kick us off. Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to this HDSA research webinar where we're going to answer your questions about HD research. I am Dr. Leora Fox, Assistant Director of Research and Patient Engagement at the Huntington's Disease Society of America. And I am joined also, uh, I don't know if you can see him, but our, our Chief Mission Officer, Dr. Eric Johnson, is with us as well. Um, as well as our speakers. And first, I'm going to walk through a couple of slides to remind you how we approach our Q&A and just let you know how to find recordings and other upcoming HDSA webinars. And then I will introduce everybody from the HD Buzz team. So this webinar is purely live Q&A. So you can type your questions into the chat box in your Zoom toolbar. If you can't find the chat box, there are three vertical dots and you can find it there. Uh, this is a closed chat, so only HDSA and all the panelists will be able to see what you've asked. And we're going to address as many questions as we can today and do our best to follow up if needed. We are recording today, so if you want to revisit this presentation or send it to somebody else in the next few days, you can go to hdsa.org slash research webinars, or you can go to HDSA's YouTube channel using the button at the top of our homepage. Usually it's up in a day or two. Uh, we're working on planning some research webinars during the month of January. And again, you can check in at hdsa.org slash research webinars or follow our social media, our research blog, or join our mailing list to be updated about upcoming webinars. If you're interested in participating in HD research, I would encourage you to check out hdsa's hdtrialfinder.org to learn more about currently recruiting clinical trials, as well as our surveys page. So right now there are tons of opportunities for anybody from an HD family to participate in research from home. Some of these have gift card raffles or other incentives and you can be a part of lending your voice to improve HD research and care. That's hdsa.org slash surveys. And uh, yeah, so as an HD Buzz editor myself, I'll also be participating in the Q&A, but I'd also like to introduce our speakers, HD researchers and HD Buzz editors, Dr. Rachel Harding and Dr. Jeff Carroll. I would guess that many of you have heard from them before, but I'll let them say hello and say a few words about who they are. Jeff, do you wanna get us started? Oh, okay, Josh. Uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, hi, I'm Jeff Carroll. I'm an associate professor at University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I'm an HD family member, a mutation carrier, researcher, um, and I can't think of anything else. <laughs> thanks, All right, I'll introduce yeah. myself next then. So I'm uh, Rachel Harding. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto um, at the place called the Structural Genomics Consortium. And my my lab is researching the Huntington protein itself and trying to figure out what it does and how that might change in people who have Huntington's disease. Uh, but I'm also a writer and editor for HD Buzz. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk to you all today. Thanks both. I see that we've already got questions coming into the chat. So why don't we start with this one? Uh, the question is, are there any updates about clinical trials for pre-symptomatic HD positive patients? Um, I can say a little bit about if that's okay, Rachel. Um, yeah, go so ahead. Uh, I think like the person who's answered this question, you know, watching my HD family get older, you know, I have the same thoughts as the rest of the community, which is that, you know, I think we've gotten along past the point where we think that there's some magical day where someone becomes positive for HD symptoms. Like it's clear that it's it's more of a, a slow accumulation of, of sort of damage in the brain over time. And so with that in mind, a lot of us really wanna push trials into that um, phase before people actually have symptoms. Um, 
And when I first started learning about how clinical trials work, I was very irritated that we weren't doing that already. And the more you learn about that, the more I sort of appreciate how hard it is. And, and the reason is this, I mean, normally when you give someone a drug and they participate in a clinical trial, you measure something, you know, their, their movement symptoms, if they have HD, some brain scans, some lab tests done on their blood, stuff like that. Um, but if someone is really truly pre-symptomatic, meaning that there aren't sort of um, markers that can be tracked, how do you know the drug is work works, right? And so you, you could say that we'll give a lot of people the drug and we'll see if they get HD at the same time you expect it or not. And that's ultimately, I think someday what will end up. Um, but with current technology, that's like a very expensive, very long trial. And I haven't seen a lot of... Um, realistic appetite among drug companies to be able to do that now. Now, there are things developing like the HDISS, which is the staging system that's come out to try to anchor different trajectories along that point from someone who's well to someone who's sick. Um, and I think tools like that are what we need. But I think what's going to happen is that we're going to do trials mostly in symptomatic people, which is what's happened so far. And I'll, I'll talk about a little bit of evolution of that that is like good news here in a second. Um, but then slowly as we figure out how to do it, I think what's going to happen is we're going to push trials back. I don't think we're suddenly tomorrow going to run a, a pre-symptomatic trial like we're all dreaming of. I, I would love that. I just think that the tools aren't there and it would be too expensive. And there's just no company in the world that would want to spend that much money, in my opinion. Well, I'd love to be wrong. Having said that, there are companies that are clearly thinking about this. So PTC is a really good example. They're ongoing. So PTC is a company that's testing one of those um, what's called um, a Huntington lowering drug. So a drug that's trying to reduce the levels of the, of the Huntington um, gene product. And they intentionally are using, trying to use people who are kind of on the cusp of having HD, but don't, don't have clear symptoms that are obviously HD yet. And so they're trying to enrich for people that are kind of in that like just before onset phase. And I think that's a really great evolution. Um, unfortunately, a trial in the US has been halted, but not, not because the drug doesn't like is, is unsafe or anything as far as we know because it's still ongoing in other countries um but i think ptc is the, the first person out the gate going the furthest in terms of trying to do pre-symptomatic um sorry that was long-winded but hopefully hopefully ended on an optimistic ish note yeah no i think that i think that was pretty thorough that was that was great i'm i'm gonna move on to uh another set of questions that somebody has which is really sort of about the overlap between different types of studies. Um, so the question is really about what data from enroll um, versus another study group, such as the Huntington study group um, and participating in a, in a different trial, um, how, you know, how that data is shared and what overlap there is here. Um, and so I want to address that um, by, really by saying that that enroll hd which is this large in, you know it's an international observational study which means that it follows folks over time um, that data is is separate from drug studies separate from other observational studies however that that data um, is available to researchers um, it's all anonymized and they can uh, if they have a legitimate question about hd that it would be helpful to have that type of anonymized data from thousands of people participating, then they can use that data to answer those questions. Um, clinical studies that are run by groups like the Huntington Study Group or other, um, you know, other universities or pharma companies um, tend to be separate from uh, that data that's being used in Enroll HD. So I think sometimes it's uh, it's difficult to have that type of crossover. However, often people who are participating in observational studies are familiar with the sites, familiar with the doctors, and uh, develop relationships with those teams. Um, and for that reason, you know, sometimes um, enroll participants are sort of approached about um, participating in, in drug studies. I'm not sure if that answers the question exactly. Um, if either of you think that there's there's something to add there, please do so. Um, there was also a question about, um, you know, people in in current studies sharing their experiences and the results. And um, I think it's really important to note that, you know, as as part of the trial experience, 
um, folks are generally asked to, to try and keep um, what they're experiencing within the trial to themselves for the purposes of staying blinded and making sure that there, there's really a lot of integrity in the results. So it's kind of discouraged to share what's happening during a trial in like a, you know, a patient group or a participant group. Yeah, and I, I'll just, I'll speak from personal experience, Leora, because I, I saw a comment in, in the chat about from someone about being frustrated that they weren't able to get the kind of results of their clinical assessments that happened when they were participating uh, in, a, in an HD clinical trial. I don't know if which drug, sorry, but, um, and, and it does sort of seem like, oh, you just measure all these things and you just tell me what they are. And, 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 and I think it's important for people who are participating in research to, and I do this myself, like I've been in an role and I've wondered like, what did I score, you know? Because um, I asked them forever to give me my IQ and they wouldn't. I was so annoyed because I was just wanted to know. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to know anymore. It's definitely gone downhill. But um, but the point is that like those like when you're doing research, it's the point of it is not to give you information about your or, or me in this case, give me information about my status. The point is to contribute to the body of research. And I think you know, some sites, I think, can combine those kind of research visits with an actual clinical visit, but it's, it's just important to kind of have the right hat on when you go into the clinic. And if you're going in there to participate in research, just to know that they may not necessarily like debrief you about what they find um, at, at every site. And, and that's, that's just because it's a kind of a different purpose of, of participation. And, and hopefully those sites would obviously let you schedule a clinical visit to, to talk with a doctor more interactively. Thanks, Jeff. I see a question here to lowering, um, where there are lots of trials and different pharma companies working on reducing the Huntington protein in the brain. And somebody's asking about um, what kind of animal data there exists um, to show that reducing the, pro the protein can reduce the symptoms or delay onset. And so is there a lot of confidence in this in, in people from studies in animals? Rachel, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I can take this one. So yeah, this uh, the person who wrote this question is very well read up on the data. And there is some pretty convincing data that at least in certain mouse models, if you reduce the amount of Huntington protein, you do see improvement of symptoms or symptoms that appear like Huntington's disease in mice. But it does remain the case that we still don't really know whether the same thing applied in humans will actually improve symptoms. And that's why we have to do the clinical trial. We know now that we have drugs that can lower Huntington in people, but whether they lead to a positive outcome and either slow down or halt the progression of symptoms in patients kind of really remains to be seen. And like, there's no way really for us to know that until we do the clinical trial. Um, so we can do a lot on like a huge amount of animal work, but getting going from animals to people is always a big step. And we, you know, you can look at other, you know, diseases where, you know, you can cure all kinds of things that look like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and other diseases in mice, but those same drugs might not necessarily work in people. And it's going from a mouse brain to a human brain is a big jump. And so, you know, we have to do as much work as we can before the clinical trial to be as sure as we can possibly be, but it's still a bit of an unknown. Um, but the only way we'll find out is by doing the clinical trials themselves. And that's why, you know, it's great that we've got all these trials ongoing that will hopefully give us an answer to that sooner rather than later. Thanks, Rachel. Um, the next question I'm seeing here is about uh, sort of emerging technologies, I would say, in HD research. So are there any gene editing technology or stem cell transplants going on in HD? And um, this person saw an article about some things going on in London. Um, I wonder if that's the, that was the article about sort of CRISPR and RNA that came out uh, last week, but um, anybody wanna talk about it? Oh, yeah, I can do it, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, we are, I know who you're not. <laughs> I know who you guys are. <laughs> right after I answer this, I'm gonna go move my curtains so I don't lose my retinas here. It's really bright in Seattle for some weird reason. Um, so yeah, so somebody asked a question about a, 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 a genome editing technique that I'll describe really briefly um, called CRISPR. So CRISPR, everyone, scientists included, all of us in the call, I'm sure included, um, are really excited about CRISPR. So CRISPR is a way of actually editing the DNA of a cell, which until um, it was described fairly recently was impossible. Like the idea was once DNA was set, you couldn't change it. 
So biology, like basic science of how we understand diseases have been revolutionized. Now we can make mouse models really fast. We can like literally like copy and paste DNA sequences into their genomes. It's amazing. We do it in cells and in mice and all the time. It's a very attractive idea for how to fix human diseases that start with a mutation, right? If HD is always caused by a CAG expansion and the Huntington gene, could we fix it by using something like CRISPR? And in, the, in mice, it's been shown multiple times using multiple different flavors of CRISPR already that you can, and it makes the mice better. And in cells, for example, even from human cells, we can edit the DNA all day long. So it's very feasible to do um, in a dish and in a lab. And there are major limitations to it being a therapy. So these are large proteins. So CRISPR, the, 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 the thing that does CRISPR is an enzyme called Cas9, and it's a really gigantic protein. And your body, especially your brain, doesn't like random proteins, in this case, from bacteria floating around, right? It has a, has a tendency to kick off an immune reaction. Also, it's not perfect. It's DNA scissors, right? Like, you, you, if you get, if people know what happens when you mess up your DNA, you get cancer. So like, there are really, really difficult limitations, particularly with HD. And the therapeutic trial the person um, mentioned in the chat, it was for leukemia. So those are diseases where you can take cells out of someone's body from their, from their blood, not deep in their brain. You can edit them in the dish in the lab, make sure nothing bad happened, and then put them back in. And even a small number of cells can basically cure that person's disease, which is amazing nothing equivalent exists for hd like we can't take out brain cells yet fix them and put them back in maybe someday we will um i'm not holding it, my breath for that happening in my lifetime um but it, it's an amazing tool in the lab um but i don't think people should look at success in immune disorders or leukemia for example and think okay this is going to happen in hd it's it's a radically different difficulty i'm gonna go move my lines sounds good jeff Maybe I can add something in about the stem cells, right? Please. Because, yeah, so this is a kind of similar revolutionary technology. And what stem cells mean for a lot of folks in the lab is, you know, these are cells that we can turn into almost any kind of cell in dishes. And that's really amazing, right? So the idea would be that maybe you could replace some of the cells in the brain that have died or they're not working properly by adding in stem cells and making them grow back into functional and healthy neurons. Um, and that would be awesome. And, you know, people can do this stuff similarly as what Jeff was saying with CRISPR works really well in cells in a dish. And there's some promising studies in mice, but that is, it's a long way off being something that's likely to be um, given to humans anytime soon, because, you know, the brain is this incredibly complicated organ all these different types of cells have to be, you know, constructed together in like this perfect kind of synchronization and 3D structure um, in order for everything to work properly. So it, you know, there's still a lot of stuff that we need to work out really about how we might best apply that technology. Um, but I think the important thing to note is that both on the CRISPR front and stem cells, there are labs all over the world who are trying to use, develop these technologies you know, not just for Huntington's disease, but for all sorts of different diseases. And, you know, breakthroughs in one area will help another area. So if this technology gets developed enough that it works for another brain disease, then we'd be like, oh, great, we can use this for Huntington's as well, maybe. So that's really good. And it means, you know, things are moving really, really fast, which is great news. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, another question we've got here is whether anyone's looking at drug combinations. So, for example, something like Huntington lowering plus another approach to HD biology, such as um, what Lenny is working on for dopadine. Um, I would say there that there are, there's a possibility of that once there are effective therapies that are disease modifying. So I think, um, you know, this is the case for other disease areas where if you have a couple of drugs that have been shown to be effective, then there might be um, a reason to either prescribe multiple ones or have a trial to show whether multiple ones can um, improve things even more. Um, but I think first, the first we need one. First, we want one disease modifying therapy and then, um, then the field's gonna explode even more and build from there. I'll just add on that, Lear, like just to say that, you know, there's precedent for that, not necessarily in HD, but in cancer and in HIV therapeutics, mm -hmm. where 
you know, in many subfields in cancer and certainly in HIV AIDS, there was just nothing forever. And then there were one drug that had like maybe some horrible side effects, but like, and they kept tweaking it and working on the dosing and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden there were a few drugs and then in combination, they're essentially never say cure <laughs> for something that, you know, you may have your whole life. But um, I, and that's what I hope for. I hope that things like protopidine will provide benefit and then people will find out that in combination with Huntington lowering like a PTC, for example, if that were to work individually, but none of these things can be tested in the clinic in combination, as far as I understand, until they've been shown to work individually. So what, you know, if you're trying to figure out what you're excited about, look for the individual trials to work or not, and then get excited about combinations. But, but certainly people, you know, the powers that be are aware that combinations are probably where we need to go. Thanks, Jeff. Another question we've got here is uh, it's sort of more on the medical side, um, whether there is merit to testing for HD a second time. So this person is saying that their family member tested negative, but there's some anxiety about whether there could have been an error. Um, maybe this is just sort of anxiety around the testing process, but is there some possibility of, of an error? I don't, I don't know if you want to speak to that, Jeff, but you know, I know that a, a lot of these things uh, these days are done in multiples and there are lots of controls in place when you do human testing such that the, the error rate is really nil. I don't know if you want to speak to your own experience, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, my whole family that are positive were tested using the same techniques that people use now many years ago. And you know, people have been retested in various situations and none of, so just like anecdotally, I've, I've never heard, and even in my like interactions with the HG community, I've never heard someone having a mistake. Not, nothing is perfect, but like CAG sizing for HD is, is pretty robust lab technique that's been done for a really long time. So I wouldn't tell anyone not to retest. I think particularly if someone's anxious and I understand the anxiety around like really believing a negative or a positive result, like I would say if you can afford it and or if your doctor will find a way to do it for free, like I don't see any downside to it. But I would just say that like if you're sitting there thinking it's like a 10% chance that it's an error, that's not true. It, I don't know what it is, but it's way, 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 way less than 1%. Yeah, I think that's important because, you know, almost any medical test will have a false positive and a false negative rate. And I think we've all become very familiar with these ideas since we've been testing a lot for COVID, that we're doing all these different tests and some tests are more sensitive, some tests are more robust, work better than others. But for this kind of human genetic test, it's so stringent and it has to be done so carefully multiple times so we're absolutely sure because it's such important information you know this isn't an infection that you're going to get over this is something that's you know can influence your life quite drastically and so it's very very unlikely that the result is wrong but i would agree i think if you're anxious and you know you're not feeling good about it and you just want to be super sure and it will help you sleep better at night then you know maybe you should find a way to do that I think there are there are a bunch of questions that I um, that are are sort of related to this I, again this idea of of data sharing between companies across studies um, having access to to that data and uh, that can be it can be really tough it can be really frustrating for people who are really giving their time and their their energy and their bodies to scientific research um, and and you know I think we all really want all of that data to be available to us. And I know that these, you know, every time we speak with these companies, they are committed to sharing uh, as soon as they're able to. It takes a long time to, to analyze these things, um, but they are, are sharing as much as they can, I would say. Um, uh, but I totally understand that it's very frustrating to not be able to have access to all of that information that you, you know, that they took from you during a, during a study. Um, but you know the the field is is very collaborative, and they really do want others to learn from from what they've learned in um, in clinical studies. So hear your frustration, um, and you know stay tuned for for updates on on the data from these trials because eventually they do have to publish every every single bit of it. There they will. Leora, could I um? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rachel. 
I was just going to say that it's it's an interesting US thing. So in Canada, my understanding is that all medical data collected from a patient, even in a clinical trial, belongs to that patient and you have a right to access that. So this is something that's specific to, I think, US law, and it probably varies with different regulations all over the world. Um, but it is an interesting point of view. And uh, yeah, and uh, you know, something that I think, you know, you can talk to people at HDSA who have a much better understanding of these sort of things than... I do, but I know that the work to get access to that data in Canada was a lot of campaigning and going to, it had to go through to the Supreme Court in order to get all access to all that information. Um, and I'm not saying we should add this to Leora's ever extending to-do list that she should go and campaign the Supreme Court so you all get your data. But yeah, maybe it's something to think about for 2023, Leora. <laughs> or we can all just move to Canada. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. You know, I think that there are ways that HDSA is working with different companies that try and help folks within the HD community have access to their own medical records within a clinical trial is a bit of a different story within the US. Um, but yeah, there's some um, you can check out picnic health, which HDSA is working with to uh, on, a, on different studies right now, um, involving folks with HD and you get a free account and access to all your own medical records. Um, I can put the link for that in the in the chat when I have a second. The, so if um, you want I... to add something. Yeah. I was just going to take another one from the chat if that's okay. Please. Um, yeah, there was a question that said, what is the reason why the Roche drug failed? That's Tominersen, one of the antisense drugs that lowers Huntington. That was the, the largest Huntington lowering trial, which, um, as folks may know, was halted um, unexpectedly. Um, and the, the question sort of talks about how the idea that they're starting a new trial in different population, but then the, um, I think incorrectly, there's an assumption in the question, which is that um, they didn't show why they failed. Um, and they have, in fact, so they haven't showed every bit of data. Um, I will say I've been watching a, every trial that's happened in Huntington for the last 15 years, at least, and Roche have been probably quicker and uh, more uh, complete in how they're talking about a negative trial result like this. Um, so I was on a call with them while they were talking with other scientists about measuring um, the levels of a, of a lab test called neurofilament light. And what happened in this trial is that suddenly 700 people who were being seen every two months having every all these lab tests were suddenly the trial was stopped. And so there was not an immediate plan in place to like measure all those things because they were planning to measure at the end of the trial. So all of a sudden they have literally thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of, of let's say, samples that they have to do this lab test in unexpectedly early and they're just like scrambling to try to make sure that they're doing it with the proper stringency which is always really hard with human samples so it's a really hard job to suddenly digest all that information but Roche have been pretty good about they've been very good in my opinion about giving talks like every HD event has like scientific event has a talk from Roche and every time they've showed a little bit more data because they've dug in a little bit more the reason they halted it is because um, of a couple things that were a little concerning. And one was that people, especially people who are on the more frequent dosing part of that trial. So some people were getting the drug, uh, I'll might screw this up, Leora, fix me if I say this wrong, uh, every eight weeks and some were doing it every 16 weeks, I think in the final trial design. And the people who were getting it more frequently um, uh, and they were all getting the same dose were had signs that their, their combined, whether they call their composite HD score, their symptom score was actually worse. So that's clearly not what you want. And that's a very good reason to halt the trial. So, so that coupled with the fact that the people's ventricles, which is the fluid filled space inside their brain increased. So the more drug people got, there was a sort of an increase in their ventricle size, which is the opposite of what you want in HD, the brain atrophies and those ventricles get bigger. So we're trying to shrink the ventricles, if anything, and, and they saw the opposite. So those two things in particular were very clear signs that they should stop the trial. And they've showed that data, um, but they've also showed data that people who had um, low, let's just say people on the less severe end of the spectrum. So people who have less long CAG repeats and people who were earlier in their disease were, did kind of the opposite. They, they actually looked clinically in terms of their symptoms. They looked a little better. Now you can't trust that finding. This is what we call a post hoc analysis, right? We're looking at the data from the trial and we're slicing and dicing in a million ways and you can fool yourself. And we've seen that a lot, but I, I think that there's a very good justification for Roche to do another trial with the drug, to try to find 
a dose and a set of HD patients, particularly earlier HD patients based on the data. And I, I think it's a smart, and I think it's based on the data that emerged from that trial. I don't think it's, I don't think it's them just trying to kind of take advantage um, or just get their drug in the market. I, I'm sure from my impression of all the people working on this, it's it's because they don't want to let a drug in that far of stage of development fail if there's any hope that it could work for a population. Thanks, PS yeah. Roche doesn't pay me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see a couple of questions here about mushrooms, two different kinds of mushrooms. Um, psilocybin and then lion's mane mushrooms. Um, whether there's any research on this, um, there's some potentially some evidence that psilocybin could protect neurons or repair connections or enhance neurotransmission. Um, and the short answer is that there's very, very little research in Huntington's disease with, um, with mushroom derived uh, compounds. Um, there really hasn't been anything in, in humans. There might be a case report or two on, um, on different neurological diseases, but there hasn't, hasn't really been any research. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of, I, and I had just answered a question for somebody via email about psilocybin recently, um, and had done a little bit of, of background research. Um, and there's, there's really very, not much in HD. There's sort of some, some of the pathways are being researched, but that hasn't, hasn't moved into um, anything related to animal models or in humans with HDs that is the short answer to that. I would also just add that a lot of, um, you know, sort of nutrition-based um, like miracle cures that we all often see with things like lion's mane and like other sort of supplements which are meant to improve symptoms um, in, you know, lion's mane is written not about just for Huntington's disease, but other kind of brain health diseases as well, is that it's important to remember that these studies are normally nowhere near as robust as a lot of the as any of the clinical trials that are being done right now with other drugs that people are working on. And this is why, like, you'll know, if you read the news, you'll often see things like, you know, red wine causes cancer, red wine cures cancer. And then you have the, all these contradictions all the time. And this is often because those studies are really not very well designed, quite poorly executed and don't have readouts that really mean very much. And that's why there's a lot of conflicting evidence um, just because of the poor kind of level of science that's being done. So I would just, you know, urge caution when you see some of these studies, just because, you know, there's, it's published as a scientific article doesn't necessarily mean it's good science. And I'll just say like, I'm again, being the old guy here, but, um, you know, I've been watching these trials closely. I, I remember when people said things like this about coenzyme Q10 and blueberry extract and, creatine and we we ran gigantic trials of creatine and coenzyme q10 at least and they failed and you know it, there's no such thing as like a free lunch and i would say that as someone who's trying really hard to make drugs for people or at least trying to support the people who are doing that i see the stringency that goes into like making a product that you're going to give to people and for some very bizarre reason in the us there's essentially no restrictions on supplements so god knows where they're made i would never take a big dose of creatine or lion's mane or whatever, because you don't know where it's made, what the contaminants are. And they have a very weirdly lax regulatory regime in the US where they can kind of just sell whatever they want. So um, I would just, I would urge caution based on that. I think people's brains are fragile enough and we should. Thanks, Jeff. I am trying to monitor the the chat as well. There was a question actually about um, auditory processing and whether that's a common changes in auditory processing are a common symptom of HD. Um, I know that Dr. Johnson is doing a little bit of um, research behind the scenes and has, you know, found a couple of, of papers related and studies related to um, some people with HD showing a, a difference from controls in, in processing auditory information, but this is um, it, it's also likely related to uh, cognitive changes that are are separate from that that auditory processing. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure how common it is, but it definitely has been noted in the scientific literature. Um, let's see. 
if you all want to jump in with stuff that I have missed, I'm just going, I'm just trying to go right down the, the list here. I'm seeing a question here about whether people are able to find out if there are interruptions in their CAG repeat tract. And uh, maybe this is something Jeff could talk about. Um, the, oh, the, the, re the interruptions. Yeah. So can people find out, first of all, what, what, is, what are these CAG repeat interruptions? And is that something that people can find out in a clinical setting with their doctor or with testing? Yeah, it's a really great question. So let me give the basic background first, just for the folks who don't know. So, um, and there's a buzz story that we can put in the chat about this. Um, but um, as actually as, as a sort of an offshoot of, of the samples that were provided by Enroll now, like I think there's like 9,000 people in this genetic modifier study I'm gonna describe in a second. Um, researchers, a uh, consortium of HD researchers were analyzing different sequence variations, like all humans that aren't identical twins have tiny variations in their DNA between us. That's what makes us people. Um, and one of those interruptions happens and in, uh, one of those little variations that ha that people have um, one or another variant of actually were found to happen in the Huntington CIG repeat. So people might know Huntington's caused by an expansion of three letters in, the, in your DNA beyond a certain number of repetitions. That's And those letters are CAG, which is just the abbreviation. Uh, for those um, those um, those DNA chemicals, um, and we always say that somebody's CAG repeat, but actually, just before the last CAG, in some people, there's not a CAG, um, but a CAA. So there's a missing CAG repeat, and it, the details get a little weedy, but the the protein that gets made from those two different sequences is identical. And so nobody thought it would make a big difference if it was CAA or CAG. It's like two different ways to say the same word. I'm, I'll think of an analogy right after I stop talking. Um, like there's different ways in biology of making the same protein and CAA and CAG are like the same sound, if that helps. And, but it turns out that actually it does make a big difference and that they found that people who have either more of those interruptions or fewer of those interruptions, their age of onset of HD is very different than you would predict. Um, and so it had a big influence on the age of onset. So that's cool and it's amazing science and it tells us some deep stuff about how HD works, but so far it's not being used anywhere clinically as far as I know. Um, a couple of things, one, those, 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 those mutations, those interruptions and the extra, the loss of interruptions, uh, are quite rare. Um, and so they're probably not in very many HD patients as a percentage. Um, and that's why you need 9,000 subjects to like see them. That's the point of these big observational studies is even if they're rare, you'll see them. So for any one person, it's probably not such a huge concern. Um, and secondly, it's just the technology. I mean, we talked about like accurately measuring someone's CH repeats. I do in my lab, like in minutes, it, it's easy to do bad. Uh, or like roughly, but doing it extremely precisely as you have to do for a human takes like incredible amounts of like validation. And, you know, it's a lot of regulatory stuff and all that. So nobody's doing that at the level of being able to read these interruptions and the technology that you need to read them is different than the technology that you need to count repeats. So you have to use sequencing instead of a technique called PCR for people who really care. But the bottom line is it's a different technology. It's pretty rare. And so the combination of those things means that so far nobody's doing it as far as I know. But ultimately, eventually, I'm sure that'll be part of your genetic testing report someday once those technologies are more widespread. Agreed. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm following along and then also uh, monitoring questions. Um, all right, we've got a bunch of questions about the Unicare study, and maybe we can just explain sort of where we are with that and, and talk about, uh, someone has asked us specifically what's, you know, what is Jeff's opinion of the Unicare study, but I think it would be good to kind of start with a, an overview of what they're doing, which is really innovative uh, first gene therapy for, for Huntington's disease, and it is uh, basically a piece of man-made DNA that that is um, that is uh, delivered to the brain in a surgery um, directly to the the part of the brain that is that is first affected by HD and it is uh, packaged inside of a virus nobody nobody wants to talk about viruses right now I'm, you know I'm, I'm sure lots of you are 
dealing with what everybody's calling the triple demic right now. But this is a harmless virus that is basically viruses are really good at getting inside of our cells and it and scientists can put a DNA or a piece of man-made DNA that they want to be inside of a cell in there. And basically what the Unicure drug does, it's called AMT-130. And when it's delivered to cells within the, the striatum, um, it, it gets taken up by cells and the cells are essentially are able to sort of produce this antidote that helps the Huntington's protein to not, to Huntington protein to, to not be made in such a large quantity. So it's a Huntington lowering drug, but it's delivered once. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to, to talk a little bit about, um, about how you feel about it, Jeff, but it's basically a very small trial that's happening in, um, in North America and Europe. Um, so far, it's really only like 40, 44 people in this first part of the trial to see whether that's even a safe a safe thing to do, but the idea is that you would, you know, deliver it once and have Huntington lowering ongoing for for the rest of someone's life. Um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to give my personal opinion. I, I need to preface it by saying I'm not a real doctor unless you are a mouse. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I'm a PhD. I'm not an MD. So take this with a massive grain of salt. This is just my scientific opinion and my personal opinion. Um, you know, I think what what Unicure are doing, um, as as Laura laid it out really well, it, it's an it's it's an incredibly intense intervention, right? Like it's a surgery; they they're infusing these viruses into your brain. Like it's it's very incredible amount of commitment required, um, and you can't stop it. Now, there are people who've been treated with these these same kind of viruses targeting different things that have had them for many years. And it, it, nobody thinks that it's gonna suddenly cause a bad reaction or else the trial wouldn't have been going on. But you know, trials are experiments. And the thing about viruses is they last and they persist. And that's what makes them so amazing. It also means you can't turn them off. And you know, whereas with something like ASOs or a, a drug like, uh, like Branaplan that you take as a syrup, you can just stop taking them if they're toxic and hopefully the effects will go away. And with gene therapy, it's irreversible. And that's that's why you never have to have the surgery again, which is amazing. It also is why it's if there's always some kind of risk and if that risk uh, emerges later, we won't be able to shut off the virus in those people's brains. And that's why they're starting so carefully with like very small trials with, with small numbers of people. So I think it's heroic. I think as a field, we have to figure out whether that that viral delivery um, could possibly help. I think their early data looks good. There was a little bit of a scare with some possibly brain inflammation in a patient, but it seems like that's resolved. And they've, the regulators have looked at all the data really carefully and they've, they've moved ahead. So it's as, it's as safe as something that experimental could be. It's incredibly like heroic for the participants to like to, to take that small but real risk. Um, but the potential benefit is also kind of remarkable that you could you know, have that benefit throughout, as far as we know, your whole life, as opposed to, you know, just a few weeks or months with a normal uh, kind of drug. Um, so there's no answer for everybody. I, I think, I think we have to figure it out. And I'm so glad people are volunteering. Uh, but it's not simple. And it's not a trivial uh, amount of risk. And I, I think everybody should know that. Yeah, thanks for that, Jeff. Um, another question here is about testing and participation in research. So if an at-risk person is not ready to test, but they are showing symptoms, can they get involved in, in clinical trials? Um, and for, for a drug study, um, you have to be positive for, for the HD gene to participate in, in most of these drug studies. That's not the case for observational trials. So you can definitely be a participant in things like enroll HD, uh, prevent HD, predict prevent HD. I always mix it up with predict. It's a the ongoing study. Um, but any observational trials or trials for which um, sometimes controls are needed or just folks who are at risk. Um, HD trial finder is a great way to, to learn more about what you might be eligible for if you are comfortable, you know, making a profile. It's all anonymous. Um, but, you know, once it's, you know, if, if a person's not ready to test for HD, then they're probably not a great candidate for a, um, a clinical trial of a drug. Um, another interesting question here, and I don't know if either of you have any insight into this, is um, whether there uh, is about testosterone supplementation and HD. 
Do either of you know anything about this? Because I'll be honest, this is not something that I'm aware of or have heard of. It sounds like multiple people have asked about this at a particular clinic. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It, it's nothing that I've even seen, as far as I can tell, like a mouse study on. Um, you know, I'd say that one thing we do know is that the, the things like enroll tell us that there's no difference between male and female HD patients, as far as we can tell, um, in terms of age of onset of symptoms. So there's not like evidence from observational data that 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 sex hormones might might influence onset of HD or progression. Um, but there may be stuff that that we don't know. Um, it's the nature of science. Yeah, can do some poking around in the literature and get back to that person. I think I know who they are. Um, uh, there's a, a tough question here about um, about suicide. So this is a I don't think if if folks are are triggered by this, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna try and answer um, generally very quickly. Um, um, I, there's def, there's definitely research into the fact that suicide is uh, happens at a higher rate in people with with HD. Um, I'm not going to be able to pull exact numbers here, but it's definitely a higher risk, and this is why you know HDSA advocates for very specific procedures when going ahead with testing and and how people are are you know getting information about their status and and just really finding a um, different ways to get support. Um, so certainly if there are um, if if there are folks in your life who are who you feel are at risk for that, that's something to um, talk to a doctor about to, to find support from a social worker or from a, a therapist. Um, and there's always the suicide hotline as well. So just really wanted to touch on that. Um, another question yeah, is, what's this, the new hotline number? I forgot. There's like a nationwide number now, right? I can, I can, or somebody maybe can look that up real quick. Maybe, maybe Eric is, uh, answering questions in the background can help us out with that. Um, yeah, I don't have it off the top of my head. That's a good one to have. Um, say it again. Oh, I'm sorry. Nine, eight, oh. eight according okay. to Google and several people in the chat. So thanks. Oh, okay, that. great. Yeah, I might, I'm jumping around here. So I didn't see that yet. Thank you all. Um, another question, does current brain donation help research or is it antiquated? Massively. Yeah, um, I was gonna say that's so, a really good question. Oh, sorry, Rachel, do you yeah. wanna start and then? Okay, I'll get involved first. But yeah, um, so HD uh, brains or people, anyone who donates their brain for HD research, like that is an unbelievably valuable resource to researchers who are trying to understand, you know, all the things that are going on in patients' brains. You know, one of the things we talk about a lot is we always have to look for biomarkers and use model systems to try and understand what's happening to Huntington's because we can't really look in the brain at the time and so having the gift of a post-mortem HD brain is incredibly valuable because it means that we can actually look and see exactly what's happening um, within that brain um, and help to understand um, you know what's going on with Huntington's disease how different cells are changing how different structures in the brain are changing and even like nowadays the technology is really incredible we can start using post-mortem brains to go all the way down to like single molecule level we can take single cells from post-mortem brains and work out you know which genes are switched on and off which ones are you know there's too much of this or too little of that and try and understand things at this super molecular level um, which is just absolutely incredible and something that couldn't really be done um, even sort of five, 10 years ago. So the donation of a brain is, you know, incredibly, you know, gratefully received by the research community. Um, and you'll hear when researchers are talking about, um, you know, doing experiments with the, any kind of brain samples, people are incredibly respectful and grateful to the patients who have made that choice and decision to donate their brain. And these samples are treated like gold dust so that everything that is done is done in the best possible way to make sure that we get the most information and the most valuable information for the HD research community from those samples. Yeah, I just posted in the chat, um, we had a talk at convention about brain donation and had a, an HDSA supported researcher talking about what he learned from um, from work with human tissues in HD. Um, we had the director of the Harvard Brain Bank come and speak to us about um, 
about uh, wh what happens with HD brain donation and how you can participate. There's the Brain Donor Project. Um, all of these require sort of registering in advance and speaking with family members or close loved ones about a plan for donating one's brain, but it's super valuable. Having worked myself with human brain samples in the past, it, they really do get treated like gold dust. It's, uh, there's a lot of respect there for it. So for anyone who's considering I, that, thank you. I just, I wanted to maybe, maybe just add on one thing, Lara, sorry to interrupt you there. Um, yeah, I just had a conversation with a, with a neuropathologist here at University of Washington, and, and he was describing how their like brain collection processes have evolved. And so as technology has evolved, even something as like, quote unquote, simple as collecting a brain has gotten a lot more like compelling and interesting. And because of what what, what um, Rachel was saying about like these incredible like new techniques, like single cell analyses, you need like incredibly well collected and frozen brains. And so now they've learned about how to like, they do an MRI before they do collect each brain and they take each brain and they freeze it at like minus however many degrees. And it's incredibly evolved how they collect these things so they can both last for a long time but also be really high quality samples uh, for many years to come yeah thanks jeff um we've got a couple of questions about sort of ongoing trials so maybe we can spend the last few minutes talking a little bit about that um first first of all was branaplam um somebody had a question which was basically was branaplam canceled um and then the other one is kind of how, where are we with the Prolenia oral drug, the Perdopidine? So um, do you want to talk about Branaplam, Jeff? Or maybe Rachel, because she it. just wrote an article about it. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> sure. Okay. So um, I'm not sure cancelled is the word I'd use, but basically Novartis have said in a statement that they are no longer going to be developing Branaplam for use in Huntington's disease. Um, and so this is an important differentiation because Branaplan was a drug designed originally for another disease. Um, and maybe it might be useful in other diseases yet. So it's not, you know, cancelled in that sense, but it's um, it's not going to be developed by that company anymore for treatment in Huntington's. Um, and this is because um, there was a trial called Vibrant HD, which Novartis was running to test Branaplan in uh, people with HD. Um, and I think, you know, there was data that the drug was lowering Huntington, but there was some side effects which weren't very good. Um, and this was originally disclosed by in August. So there's an independent data monitoring committee who are tracking data collected through the trial as things are happening. So the company can't actually know what any of that data says till after the fact. And basically they had a number of things that really didn't look very good. Um, and in particular, the thing that was the red flag back in August was this idea of peripheral neuropathy. So this is basically, you know, um, often is sometimes things in like the ends of the tips of your thing, fingers and you just don't have very good emotional feeling or sensation. Um, and it can kind of grow from there, basically. And so that was not good. Um, and that's not really a good sign for a drug that we want to treat uh, brains with and improve brain health. Having a symptom like that is not a good sign. And then after a more thorough review, because, um, you know, sometimes trials will be paused, but then they might restart again. Um, this was not the case with this. And so the trial has now ended. Um, and the, the symptoms that are being observed in the data that's been collected since and everything that's been sort of analyzed since that first thing in August. Yeah, we wrote about this just recently in HD Buzz, as Leora and Jeff were mentioning. Um, and there's a number of things that don't look, you know, are basic symptoms that we don't want to see in HD patients. Um, but, you know, one thing that we're hopeful for is that Branapam, like Jeff was saying, is not a one shot therapy like Unicure. So if you have things that don't look very good, you know, what the hope is that when you stop taking the drug, maybe things will get better. And so what's going to happen, all the people who were in that trial will continue to be monitored. And we're going to be, you know, people are going to be keeping a super close eye on them to see how their symptoms might change over time, with the hope being that now they've stopped taking the drug, that they will get better. Um, and that's um, our hope for that community of patients. Jeff, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add. Uh, no, and I mean, did we mention the, the Roche announcement that they're also looking at a similar thing? 
Yeah. Oh, that's a good thing to say. So, you know, this brandoplam is a drug that is something called a splice modulator. And so what this does is um, it's a kind of drug which will change the amount of which genes are switched on and off um, um, and all to do with how they're processed. So you can change the, how much you have of each gene um, being expressed in each cell. Um, and there are all kinds of different ways that you can do this. And there are a number of different companies other than Novartis. Um, including Roche and PTC Therapeutics, who are also developing um, splice modulator drugs, which are hopefully going to result in Huntington lowering. That's the aim. PTC is obviously far ahead. They're already in clinical trials with Pivot HD. Roche made an announcement recently at EHDN, I think it was, that they have a splice modulator for Huntington's disease that's currently in preclinical development. So that means they're still testing it in the lab. Uh, they don't they, they have no plans for a clinical trial with that just yet. But what this means is that this kind of approach isn't just shutting down because one company drug didn't pan out how we hoped. There are other people who are trying to make better versions of a drug that does something quite similar that they hope will have not have those side effects, but will still give you the Huntington lowering that might be beneficial. And that's what will be tested in the year or so to come with Pivot HD from PTC. Yeah, and I think there's there are some follow up question. There's a follow up question here about um, basically about people being willing to take on neuropathy if it means that the drug would slow their HD or stop their HD symptoms. Um, and I think that you know there's hope in these other other types of drugs of similar in a similar vein um, that would maybe not have so many of those side effects. I think you know neuropathy is basically damage to the nervous system. So if we're you know we're trying to have a drug that improves things within the nervous system. Um, damaging neurons is really is really not a great sign, um, and neuropathy sucks. It's just it's no fun. Yeah, I was just going to say, it, it, you know, some, sometimes these things don't sound that bad when you read about like something like neuropathy, but it can be really terrible and debilitating and progressive. And and there are whole suites of human diseases that whose main symptom is neuropathy and. A lot of drug companies are are just trying to figure out how to fix it. it, it I think it's 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 a non-trivial side effect uh, up to like really progressively damaging. And um, I think Leora's point is really good. It, 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 we already have fragile brains in HD, and and anything that makes neurons unhappy makes me just really nervous. So maybe I I know we touched on um, on this with uh, somebody asked about prodopidine. Um, and what's going on with that. Um, and that's another, that's a totally different approach that is attempting to uh, protect neurons through um, through the uh, sigma one pathway. It's a, it's a particular um, pathway that might, you know, enhance protection in neurons. And what we know about that trial right now is that it is ongoing. They've recruited everybody they need and everyone in the trial has to go on the drug and be on the drug or the placebo for about 18 months. And so we expect to hear from them around the second quarter of, of next year about the data from that trial. Um, maybe we can answer this one about uh, communication. This person says that they have family members with HD who have significant difficulty communicating and how uh, difficult is it to, to know whether they're really understanding versus um, versus being able to communicate. So can, can folks with more advanced HD really understand um, our communications? And I, I think there that the answer is, is yes. Um, there is someone within the HD community named Jimmy Pollard who talks a lot about this uh, concept of, of hurry up and wait. Um, and often folks in the later stages of HD just need some time to kind of process the information that they're hearing and be able to, to respond. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't understand. It just sometimes takes them some time. So it's best really to, to be very patient and wait for them to respond and, and know that they're able to understand you, but that they might not be able to communicate as well. Does that make sense to, to you, Jeff? Um, yeah, so I think we're, yeah, we're getting, we're getting to the, the top of the hour, the bottom of the hour here. So I think to respect everyone's time, we will go ahead and wrap up. If we, if you feel that we haven't answered your question, please reach out to HDSA and we can, we can definitely follow up as best we can. 
Um, I want to thank Jeff and Rachel so much for joining us today and answering community questions. And thank you all who came on this call to, uh, to, to really engage with research and to, to ask us your questions. And um, we're, HDSA is always available to, to facilitate that. If you've got more research questions, please reach out to me, lfox at hdsa.org. And um, to everybody who's celebrating, happy holidays, uh, have safe travels. Hope you have a healthy and joyful holiday season. And thanks everybody for being here. Have a great rest of your week. Bye, thanks everybody. Thanks for having us.